Thank you very much, Beverly, and thank you, Julia, for the invitation. Uh, I, I was actually wondering about uh, what to uh, present at this translational psychiatry meeting, and I thought perhaps uh, uh, trying to convert uh, knowledge base into criteria for application in the field, both for research and for clinical practice, may be one good example of that. And uh, in that, I probably am informed by my participation in the Neurocognitive Disorders Work Group of DSM-5, as well as VASCOG in trying to get a new set of criteria. And perhaps it also kind of uh, in, uh, exemplifies the kind of processes that go on when committees get together to try to come up with sets of criteria. Uh, so, and vascular cognitive disorders are probably a good example in that uh, one would imagine that what you're trying to see is you, you have uh, patients where you have uh, demonstrable cognitive problems, and what you really want to establish is whether this person has cerebrovascular disease that can account for uh, those uh, cognitive problems. And because currently we do have the technology to look at cerebrovascular disease, uh, one would think that this is probably an easy process. It's a much easier process than trying to uh, define some of the psychiatric disorders we've been hearing about uh, earlier today. But from uh, what we can see in the literature, it hasn't been an easy process. Uh, in fact, uh, going back to DSM-1, uh, we, of course, talked about chronic brain syndromes in those days. And uh, uh, we still had the concepts uh, from the past, from the 19th century, in fact, that a lot of uh, cognitive problems were because of arteriosclerosis. And in fact, uh, arteriosclerotic dementia was supposed to be the predominant form of dementia in those days. But then uh, early work, which is not listed here, of course, in the 60s, uh, from Martin Roth's group, et cetera, showed that Yes, certain amounts of infarcted brain could lead to a dementing process. And they actually said that you'd probably need about 50 mil of brain uh, tissue loss to produce a picture like that. And the landmark study by uh, Hetchinsky in the 70s, uh, uh, which was actually uh, with neuropathological verification, uh, actually set the, set the scene for perhaps two decades in terms of how vascular dementia was being looked at. And that was that you uh, were talking about multi-infarct dementia. So you basically had people who had multiple strokes and that added on cognitive problems to the point that uh, you had a picture of dementia. So you had uh, a situation where vascular dementia became synonymous with multi-infarct dementia. And that's what we were taught in medical school. When things have changed to some extent, and uh, that change has again been brought about by uh, technology to some extent, that uh, with the introduction of MRI, we realized that uh, vascular disease was much more prevalent and had uh, uh, more varied manifestations in the brain and not just uh, large strokes. And people started looking at a revision of these criteria, and there were some uh, attempts in the early 90s to come up with a new set of criteria. Uh, the California group uh, which was led by Helena Chu, uh, came up with their set of criteria, which are often referred to as the ADTC or the California criteria. And then there was an influential workshop in the 91, which was published in 93, which is the Nins Aaron uh, workshop. Uh, and this uh, proposal actually became the sort of standard for uh, many years uh, uh, in terms of how uh, neurocognitive uh, disorder due to vascular pathology was being defined. And then there have been a number of attempts in following that. So let me, let me try to actually uh, uh, define the issues here and how, what are the, the, some of the core issues that one is trying to grapple with in coming up with a definitive set in the end. The first concept, of course, is of dementia and how is that defined. And uh, here, uh, there has been a problem. And that problem has been that dementia, of course, most people accept that it's you're talking about cognitive disturbance in a number of cognitive domains. Uh, so you need two or more domains to be uh, uh, affected uh, to make a diagnosis of dementia. And 
most definitions of dementia mandate that memory impairment is uh, one of those domains. And that has been one of the difficulties in uh, defining uh, criteria for vascular cognitive problems. The, the other uh, problem has been that uh, just as any other uh, neurocognitive disorder, that you, there are, of course, grades of disturbance of uh, cognition. And not everyone would, uh, with cerebrovascular disease meets the criteria for dementia per se, because there are sub-syndromal patients, so to speak. Uh, so they're milder end of the spectrum. And how does one deal with those uh, it has been the other issue. Now, this, this problem of memory being a mandated disturbance has uh, been a kind of an Alzheimerization of the definition of uh, dementia. In fact, uh, in fact, when you talk to people from the Alzheimer's disease field, that they think that they kind of own dementia and don't touch this and don't touch the definition. Whereas uh, uh, the vascular group have said that, look, we see a lot of people with uh, neurocognitive problems who do not have significant memory impairment. And what do you do with those people? Do you really call them dementia or not? Now, uh, so, uh, so part of the process in DSM-5 has been to actually see, okay, what do you do with this problem of memory impairment as being a necessary feature? And the other problem has been that what what kind of evidence do you need to establish that there is significant cerebrovascular disease? And do you always need laboratory evidence? Or is uh, clinical evidence sufficient? Or do you always need neuroimaging? And what do you do when you do not have neuroimaging available, and as is common in many settings? And a third problem has been, which I've not highlighted here, is uh, most people do not have access to neuropsychological testing. So what kind of thresholds do you actually apply to make a diagnosis of dementia? Now, uh, just put this up to say that uh, ICD-10 def similarly defines uh, dementia as having memory and uh, other domain decline, uh, uh, so like DSM-4. So it has the, the same difficulty. Uh, and the the... Uh, in fact, when DSM-4 put forward the criteria, they included neuroimaging as possible uh, evidence. But uh, ICD, because it deals with an international audience, uh, said that, okay, we should not include neuroimaging in, in this. And they, uh, they actually said that uh, focal brain damage due to clinical evidence was what was needed uh, to make a diagnosis. Okay, so we can skip this. Now, how did... Uh, uh, Nins Aaron uh, deal with this uh, uh, issue. Uh, a few uh, things came up. The first, of course, was the issue of dementia. Should they uh, actually tackle that uh, uh, discrepancy between the presentation of vascular dementia and the definition of dementia? They left it. They actually did not address that issue of dementia. They said that dementia was diagnosed as uh, is usual with DSM-4 and ICD-10. So memory remained a necessary uh, criterion. Uh, then they, uh, in trying to establish evidence for cerebrovascular disease, uh, uh, they, uh, they said, okay, you could have, uh, of course, uh, clinical evidence, and you could have neuroimaging evidence. And uh, they said, okay, if you had one or the other, uh, you uh, would probably suffice to make a diagnosis, but to make a more definitive diagnosis, and, and that was a level of probable uh, vascular dementia as opposed to possible vascular dementia, you did need uh, neuroimaging. But there, was, there were a few more concessions given in terms of neuroimaging, and uh, the concessions were that, okay, multiple infarcts were usually necessary, but sometimes you can get vascular dementia with a single strategic infarct, uh, say if it's a, say a large temporoparietal infarct, for example, or thalamic infarct, you may actually have single infarcts and you get a picture uh, resembling uh, dementia. Now this was actually not including patients who were aphasic because of a single stroke. They were not uh, considered to be demented. The other concession given was that you could have multiple lacunar infarcts uh, that and not necessarily large strokes affecting the cortex for this diagnosis. 
and finally, that you could have extensive white matter disease. And I think this went back to the, the old concept of Binswanger's disease, when uh, uh, dementia was diagnosed in these uh, couple of patients that Binswanger had published uh, in the early 20th century, uh, who had uh, cognitive impairment and only white matter disease. And with the uh, introduction of MRI, it became uh, apparent that uh, there were many patients with extensive white matter disease who presented with cognitive impairment. And that concession was given by uh, these criteria that you could have just that and yet make a diagnosis of uh, vascular dementia. The problem, of course, was how much of uh, white matter lesions were sufficient uh, to make this diagnosis. And uh, uh, I'll come to that quandary as to how does one deal with that issue. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, the, the third point is that you have uh, cognitive impairment on one hand, you have uh, evidence of uh, cerebrovascular disease on the other hand, and how are the two uh, linked to each other? And the typical story in the past has been that, okay, you have stroke and you have disturbance of cognitive impairment soon after the stroke. So it's a kind of a stepwise uh, progression or an abrupt onset of uh, deterioration. And uh, the, the fact that extensive white matter disease was considered to be sufficient in many cases suggested that often this may not happen in that stepwise fashion or in a, an abrupt onset uh, uh, that you one would expect. And that actually presented a problem for the uh, classification uh, in that if you included this uh, third point to establish that relationship between the two, then you were left with this difficult issue of uh, uh, extensive white matter disease which presented with a, a slowly progressive course. Now, of course, uh, when criteria are published, people try to look at their reliability uh, and, of course, correspondence in terms of validating uh, uh, concordant validity. And uh, with these criteria, it was shown that the concordance between different criteria was actually, in fact, quite low uh, in the majority of cases. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's something that one has to live with uh, to some extent. Uh, I think in trying to establish the truth, really, uh, whether you can say, okay, the, the progression is towards the truth or towards the the reality as we really see it, and uh, maybe that doesn't tally with what has been in the past. But uh, one problem was highlighted by this paper by Ingmar Skoog and colleagues, is that depending upon what you included as your evidence for vascular dementia, the proportion of patients with vascular dementia in an epidemiological sample varied considerably. So if it was just stroke history, it was only 35%. It was uh, Focal symptoms and CT infarctus, so only 13%, whereas if you included white matter lesions on MRI scan or stroke history or infarcts, the rates went up uh, to as high as 85% of that of your cases of dementia. So where is the consensus? Um, the consensus is, okay, we have a neurocognitive disorder. How are, how are we carve it? How are, what thresholds we use for defining it? Evidence of this and an association. So people accept that these are the strong the basic principles on which you're going to define your criteria. But uh, then things, of course, consensus breaks down after that. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking at cognitive domains, um, the, the, after this, uh, with various uh, DSM-5 sessions and the VASCOG meeting and all, uh, generally there is acceptance that if you're looking at some of the core features of cognitive disturbance in these cases with the cerebrovascular disease. The disturbance is in the speed of information processing and frontal executive function. And memory function is important, but the nature of this memory distur disturbance may not be the same as in Alzheimer's disease. And sometimes memory disturbance uh, may not be present. And of course, because of the very nature of cerebrovascular disease, uh, there is great heterogeneity in uh, the nature of the cognitive deficits that you see. And uh, therefore, what DSM-5 has done is that it has retained all the cognitive domains and it hasn't kind of mandated or isn't going to mandate any particular uh, domain as being necessarily present, but it's not going to either exclude any cognitive domain either. And I think that's really 
what the VASCOG consensus seems to be. So essentially the diagnosis of dementia or mild cognitive disorders uh, could occur with any uh, one or two neurocognitive domains and memory will not necessarily be mandated. I think that's really where uh, people have settled, really. Uh, there's there's not, not much more in, in terms of uh, defining that. Now, the, the other issue is, of course, can neuropathology inform us uh, uh, much more about defining uh, vascular uh, neurocognitive disorders? The main points are that it's customary to distinguish hemorrhagic and ischemic lesions. And uh, in fact, many studies of uh, vascular dementia only uh, take ischemic uh, lesions into consideration or only follow up patients with ischemic strokes. And partly that's because it's much more difficult to actually follow up hemorrhagic uh, patients and uh, they've been excluded as a consequence. They're not pure in terms of uh, the nature of the lesions that you see on the brain. When you actually look at the neuropathology, that's very varied. And uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting findings that is emerging from neuropathology is, of course, that the mi micro infarcts, small infarcts, which may be uh, 0.5 millimeters or so uh, in size, may be very important, and that they are often ignored even by neuropathologists, and they're underreported. And when you actually look at, uh, of course, uh, the range of neuropathological lesions, uh, it's very wide uh, in any uh, series of patients. But when you try to relate uh, these uh, uh, neuropathological uh, lesions to vascular dementia, you find that some trends seem to emerge. One is that uh, uh, cystic infarcts or large infarcts with, which have kind of hollowed out uh, in, in the middle are not that common in these patients with vascular dementia, and that microinfarcts and lacunar infarcts are really very important. And when you combine that with non-infarct changes in the brain, they seem to be very important in uh, uh, the clinical as clinical determinants of uh, these cases. And uh, Winters concluded from the neuropathological data that ischemic vascular disease appears to correlate widespread uh, ischemic vascular dementia appears to correlate with widespread small ischemic lesions distributed through the CNS. So I think that's the, the message that is emerging from neuropathological data and increasingly from MRI data as well. If you look at another study, which uh, I think is quite uh, illustrative as well, uh, and these are neuropathological data from kind of a community cohort, so to speak. So these are not select patients. But when they try to look at... Uh, uh, indicators of dementia uh, in terms of neuropathology found that when you look at plaque counts, they really were not significant indicators in this epidemiological sample. The Brach stages, which is based on tangles, you find that the stage five and six increases the odds of being demented by well, about sixfold. And having microinfarcts, more than two microinfarcts, were in fact the most significant determinant of having dementia at, uh, prior to death. Uh, uh, similarly, Lewy bodies, but they were not that common. And cystic infarcts uh, were, uh, of course, uh, having two or more were, were, signif uh, were not significant, but I mean, they had odds ratio about two, but it was a non-significant uh, finding. So again, uh, this is one area which is receiving increasing attention, uh, the microinfarcts in the brain, and something that neuropathologists have uh, not uh, paid a lot of attention to. And also neuroimaging may not be able to easily uh, uh, distinguish. And many of these microinfarcts may actually lie within the white matter uh, lesions that we see on MRI scan. Uh, maybe I can skip this. As far as uh, infarct volume and dementia is concerned, this is one of the other uh, uh, areas that, I mean, have has stuck around uh, since... Roth's findings, and then, of course, Hachinsky's paper in the 70s, that, okay, you needed a certain amount of uh, uh, infarcted uh, 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 brain to produce dementia. So if you contrast uh, individuals with less than 15 mil uh, of infarcted volume with more than infected, 15 mil infarcted volume, and uh, 
uh, look at the ones with dementia, of course, you expect that these people will have, these people will have more Alzheimer type pathology. But in, what, what really is important is that these people with less infarction, they are more likely to have white matter disease and microinfarcts. Uh, so uh, the picture, again, painted from here is that you have these patients with extensive white matter lesions, microinfarcts, and not necessarily a large amount of uh, overall infarcted brain tissue uh, to produce the picture of dementia. And uh, of course, the NUN study, which most of you are familiar with, showed that uh, uh, it was uh, often a combination of Alzheimer type pathology and infarction that was important in uh, producing a picture of dementia. And that, that is the other quandary that faces uh, taxonomists in that uh, when you come to older people, uh, uh, often it's multiple pathologies that really produce the end result rather than one disease uh, per se. And that, I think, is another issue that uh, uh, classifications have uh, got to address. So are we looking at subclasses of uh, vascular cognitive impairment? Uh, and uh, one could say that, okay, there are these, perhaps these subtypes, uh, of uh, large infarcts or cerebral infarcts, multiple small or micro infarcts, strategic infarcts, cerebral hypoperfusion, which is non infarction related change, hemorrhages, and cerebrovascular disease with Alzheimer's disease uh, pathology, uh, which has been sometimes called as mixed dementia. Okay. Now, where does neuroimaging stand? And uh, do, can we have neuroimaging criteria? Uh, for this. And of course, when it comes to classification such as uh, CDSM-5 or ICD-11, we have to accept the fact that neuro neuroimaging will not always be available to the clinician. And therefore, you cannot impose those as necessary criteria. Okay? They have to be optional. Uh, the NINS neuroimaging criteria for vascular dementia was evidence of relevant cerebrovascular disease by brain imaging, including multiple large infarcts or single strategic infarct as well as multiple basal ganglion white matter lacoons or extensive periventricular white matter lesions or combinations thereof. But I think it also is necessary to point out that neuroimaging has another role to play, and that is in excluding uh, vascular cognitive disorders or vascular dementia, in that absence of vascular disease on MRI uh, and CT is strong evidence against the diagnosis. And I think that's how clinicians often use uh, uh, neuroimaging. Uh, okay, I can skip this. One of the uh, things that in, if you look at the nins Aaron criteria and they uh, address the issue of how much white matter lesions were really necessary, and they came up with this figure of 25%, that if 25% or more of white matter sh was showing hyperindensity or abnormality on MRI, then that was a suggestion that this may be sufficient to produce dementia. Now, not everyone actually agrees with that, but that 25% uh, came from uh, these uh, two studies uh, from a group which actually looked at uh, people with less than 25% or greater than 25% or uh, mild and moderate, and in fact showed that people with dementia who had less extensive white matter lesions had a picture which resembled more like Alzheimer's disease, whereas people, people with extensive, more extensive white matter lesion had a picture which was more like subcortical dementia. But this has not been replicated by other uh, studies. So in fact, there is no consensus on how much uh, white matter should, be, uh, should show abnormality to make a diagnosis. And in fact, that's what the VASCOG consensus is, that we have to leave it open and leave it to, for judgment and perhaps just say that large confluent lesions are probably what uh, are necessary for the diagnosis. Uh, so uh, I think with what's happening with neuroimaging is that uh, as newer techniques are developing, especially say with diffusion tensor imaging, you find that there is often abnormality in what looks normal on a T2 weighted, your traditional T2 weighted image. So uh, the the question is how far does one change, chase uh, this kind of abnormality? And uh, there is no definite uh, answer to that uh, issue. So when I actually asked uh, the California group, okay, now what would you change from your criteria? Uh, 
that you've uh, suggested in the past. They said, okay, we will include executive disturbance as probably an important criterion. We say that two in lacoons, one or two lacoons may not be enough. You probably need more than two lacoons uh, uh, to make a diagnosis. And that severe white matter disease uh, may be sufficient, uh, which wasn't something in the California criteria uh, per se. And that also that hippocampal volume, uh, in fact, uh, uh, seems to suggest that hippocampal volume may not be a good indicator and, uh, of uh, uh, necessarily Alzheimer type pathology. And uh, uh, they, their neuropathological studies seem to suggest that uh, people with pure vascular dementia often have smaller hippocampi. Uh, so that, that's something that, again, uh, needs replication, but it's, again, something that goes against uh, the conventional wisdom. Okay, so, uh, and when I asked uh, 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 Gustavo Roman about uh, he, the nins Aaron criteria, he, he seemed to suggest that we have to look at cerebral blood flow, and increasingly we have measures of cerebral blood flow as uh, to introduce them into the criteria. So where do we stand now then with a proposal for DSM-5 and uh, in terms of a consensus on uh, the criteria for uh, uh, vascular cognitive disorders? The first point is that there is acceptance that these disorders lie on a continuum. So you need to have a mild disorder uh, kind of diagnosis in addition to a dementia diagnosis. Uh, and that, how you define that mild uh, uh, neurocognitive disorder, there's no consensus on using precise cutoffs. But uh, DSM-5 suggests uh, between one to two standard deviation for age-adjusted uh, uh, means uh, for this diagnosis. And only mild impairment in daily functions. Uh, whereas uh, the uh, question of the major neurocognitive disorder or dementia uh, is greater than two standard deviation. Now, again, I, I haven't gone into this issue of uh, the term dementia. Uh, should that continue or should that be dropped and be replaced by major uh, cognitive or neurocognitive disorder? Uh, I think for DSM-5, it will probably be uh, retained in parentheses. Uh, the, in fact, the vascular community, vascular cognitive community is quite happy for dementia to be dropped. They were never happy with dementia, per se. But uh, Alzheimer's disease community is strongly opposed to, to dropping uh, dementia. Uh, and generally, uh, neurologists and psychiatrists feel that dementia is a very useful term to re be retained in the classificatory system. So the proposed criteria would have, uh, uh, of course, the diagnosis of that syndrome and uh, but and supportive clinical features that suggest that this may be possible vascular etiology, uh, including uh, 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 if it could be a stepwise course or it could be a gradual course, in which case uh, certain cognitive dysfunctions such as speed information processing and frontal executive functioning would uh, gain prominence. And then neuroimaging evidence, which uh, basically is a sum of what I'll be discussing uh, uh, and could have either neuroimaging evidence or neurological evidence uh, uh, to suggest that there is significant cerebrovascular disease and some supporting features uh, such as uh, gait disturbance or falls, uh, urinary problems, pseudobulbar palsy, etc. And in in exclusion criteria such as uh, history uh, suggestive of another disorder or uh, neuroimaging suggesting lack of uh, uh, cerebrovascular disease or uh, other medical conditions being present. And then uh, a level of certainty of the diagnosis from definitive, which was histopathologically proven or having a genetic basis or uh, uh, probable or possible. Okay, I think I've covered uh, most aspects. And of course, a recognition that there could be multiple uh, etiologies and uh, uh, could be so diagnosed in the classification. 